My earliest memories as a child going to Seth Colony, Rangaraman Jenga's place, are still vivid in my memory. You have to go in and through a narrow staircase up to the first floor where in the hall he'd be sitting facing you and facing him would be the statue of Venadanammal. Both for our classes and the Friday sessions we would go there to his place and we had several lovely memories of music lessons as well as music sessions uh, happening in, in that uh, house, in that hall. Friday sessions, all the students would play, taking turns. In the classes, I would be alone or with my mother sometimes. And he would decide which veena I would play on. So I had to select the veena, tune it. And he was very impatient while we were tuning the veena. He said, no, 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 get on with the business. And that's how my classes, my impressions remain of Seid Colony. Rangira Marjanga was born on 2nd February 1902 on Tai Pusam. He had a lot of music even as a child. He was associated with Shimri Sundaramayar for nearly 10 years. Being always a music enthusiast, he would unfailingly take in all the concerts in Manargudi as well as the neighborhood. And so he had told us he would listen to Madhurai Pushpavanam, Ramnathapuram Srinivasengar, Naina Pillai and several other stalwarts. Soon after he had started going to the Friday sessions of Venadanamal till the end. It was an unfailing Friday visits to her place. And we owe that legacy to his visits and his painstaking uh, noting down of whatever he had heard and whatever he was able to capture and pass it on to us. With a broken voice, struggling against odds, I am trying to do something to salvage and preserve the little that I have been able to scrape together and shape in the light of my study, research and constant listening to the great veterans of the past, all of whom disappeared before 1930, except the Siddha Vidyadhari of hallowed memory, who lived on till the year 1938. She was gathered to her fathers on October 15, 1938. Not a day has passed since then, but I have been thinking of her I have been clinging to persistent, poignant memories of all kinds. Music that a merciful providence made it possible for me to listen and profit through a long period of 12 years. His will be done. Actually, initially, people used to make fun of him because he used to note down everything in his notebook, come down, sit under the street lamp. Before forgetting anything, he would write it down and he would go home and practice whatever he had heard. But that wasn't easy for him. His enthusiasm was there forever, evergreen, but the spirit was there, the body was failing. He was a grown man. He bought a veena, tried his hand at it, and got so frustrated he sold the veena. This happened four times. You must see his desperation. Fifth time he resolved he will not give away the veena and he will not leave off pursuing his passion. 
And that's what accounts for his success in imbibing as much of her details as he could, which he displayed on the radio program, All India Radio, radio which she, she came and listened to it, and she was impressed. But he has said that two Fridays after that, he was scared to face her. He didn't go. The third Friday happened to be Varalakshmi Nambu, and he went there and she said, what happened to you? Why didn't you come all these days? And he said, I was scared to face you. He said, no, you shouldn't be scared. You played well. I'm pleased. And because of that, she agreed to teach him and she taught him on Wednesdays till her death, the last two years of her life. Being a very focused learner, the Wednesday sessions, he must have learnt many, many songs from her directly. And in his book, he writes that the song that he learnt on the day of Makara Shankaranti, 1938, was Sri Rukmanisha in Atana, Venkatatri Swami's piece. But for some reason, he has not taught this song directly to any of his students. I picked it up from the book. As soon as he moved into his rented flat, which he called Sabarmati, he was very keen that he should have a statue of Dhanamal there when he played his veena. S. Rajam recalls that he helped Rangaramarjungar get the statue made through one Nenkatesh who was associated with the School of Arts. Regarding the picture of Rangaramarjangar and Venadharamal, Rangaramarjangar has been criticized for manufacturing evidence and people claim there is no documentary evidence for him having learned from the, the great woman. Padmavardhan comments in Shruti that first of all there is no need for such an evidence because the music speaks for itself. Secondly, on the internet, if you look up Vinodharamal, the first photo you get is the from, taken from this very picture. That's the one which is available with everyone. And as far as music is concerned, photograph doesn't, doesn't necessarily count as documentary evidence. It's the playing of the music that counts. The cornerstone of Rangaramarjanga's music education was music literacy. He believed not only in teaching people how to play the veena or sing, but they should also be able to read music and notate music. Whatever they hear, they should be able to notate that. And thus has stood my mother and me in very good stead over the years when we tried to pick up music from other sources, we could convert it to this style and notate it also. Um, but if you look at his notational system, at the beginning it was very sketchy. Uh, look at the notation he has done for my aunts, Gomati and Janaki. The Varnam notated there is so is, is, is barely notation, hardly notation. 
but then as he went along of course he he built in a lot of details and he systematized his own way of notating we'll come to that by and by the first major attempt at notation was when he helped papanasam shivan notate his first 100 krutis uh, in 1934 at that time he was teaching my aunt, uh, aunts gomati and janaki and one of one day they they have told me he came in and sat down silently without talking to them without asking them to play and they were surprised and then slowly he started singing karnakan kodi vendum and there were, there were tears running down his cheeks he said that man ma he is remarkable so that was his experience notating shivan songs and uh, that first volume is still popular in and in use uh, by musicians generally his second experience was notating purandar dasa for uh, lalitangi and ml vasanta kumari at that time he was teaching my mother and he has told her that they would come mother and daughter duo would come in a rickshaw all the way from george town to said colony sit there with them with him and sing song after song and he would notate them and before they left he would sing all the songs back to them to see whether he had notated it correctly and that was the second attempt at notation his ultimate refined product was in 1947 when he notated the first volume of sri krutimani malai on time for the tyagaraja centenary he was greatly influenced by subrahma dikshita's notational system the first edition of krutimani malai was brought out between 1947 the death centenary of tyagaraja and 1953 and it covered compositions of tyagaraja muthuswami dikshitar shyama shastri subrai shastri pre trinity and post trinity composers uh and it had a variety of compositions by pallavi gopalayar uh, kumar etendra and many tamil compositions and in 1959 he brought out ashtapati a volume of 24 ashtapatis based on danamal's rendering some of them are no less beautiful than padams for instance pashyati dishi in shankarabaran some of the ashtapatis were rendered by danamal slightly differently take the case of bahadi malaya in darbari kannada
The next project in 1960 was uh, setting to music the lyrics of E. R. Nair, Yogananda Dasar and it was brought out in 1960 as I said. These were the major notational tasks that he set for himself. Apart from this, later on he brought out the Pallavi book, the book on Pallavi and then of course his theory books, History of South Indian Music, uh, uh, Sangeeta Ratnakara. Till later he also brought out a Valmi, edition of Valmiki Ramayanam in translation. So, his, his life was devoted to publishing music, writing about music and theorizing about music. Our Alapana again is full of musical phrases culled from different sources. It is never the same when you play it for different Kritis. It is culled from composition, the wide repertoire that we have different compositions in the same raga, they help us develop ideas. Alapana is driven by ideas rather than just notes, plain notes, note sequences. And another feature is that we had to be brief. He did not believe in half an hour alapanas. He had to be brief. And the reason was he hated repetition. The initial stages when I played an alapanai, he started listening with his eyes closed. And then, after two minutes, he told me to stop. He said, that phrase you have rendered five times. Try and avoid it. Make, it, make changes, minor changes, so that you do not repeat yourself, which is quite unlike the Namal style. Now we come to Tanam. Tanam again is phrase driven and also driven by the various techniques employed in the left hand. The different types of gamakas and phrasings that are possible by moving the forefinger and the middle finger. And again, you have to avoid repetition, it cannot be the same, nor can it be me mechanical addition, deletion of notes. They have to be driven by phrases and very importantly when you do ragamalika, the switch between ragas has to be very subtle and smooth. should not stop and start another raga, should glide from one to the next imperceptibly. For instance, if two ragas have common notes, his suggestion was that start with the common note and go on to the different divergent ones, so that the change over from one raga to the other is smooth and without abrupt breaks.
In the early 70s, my parents had booked me for a Pallavi competition in Chennai. And my father requested Nangara Marjanga to teach me a Pallavi. And he taught me Hridaya Kamalavasa in Karaharapriya. He taught me how to do Nirval and, and Trikalam and everything for Pallavis. And that set him off on his new project. He brought out a collection of Pallavis in a next book published soon enough. The rendering of Ketanas, again, was replete with details and subtle nuances. And we also follow the same technique that Dhanamal employed in her 78 RPM records. A, sang a Sankati is never repeated mechanically. There will be minor changes, subtle changes that you have to listen for. And since Vadnams are more complicated than the simpler Ketanas, he always insisted on starting with simple Ketanas. My lessons began with Sri Saraswati, the Nostate, R.B. Dikshitar. And I, I, I started my daughter on Sharanam Bevani in Gambir and Atta, Purandar Dasar. So after five or six small short pieces, then a Varna will be attempted, not till then. Rangana Marjiga's repertoire was vast. It was not perhaps all derived from Dhanamal. He had started listening to music from his childhood. And he did, does mention Chimini Sundaramayar and how he remembered many of the compositions that he had heard in his childhood. But what is unique is that all the things that he heard went through the fire and test of Dhanamal's style. So when he taught a composition to a student, it had this test of Dhanamal's style. And because of his vast repertoire, he didn't repeat compositions to different sets of students. For instance, the compositions he taught my aunts were different from the compositions he taught my mother. Coming to Padams, you have to remember this is about veena rendering and not vocal. And it's not for dance. It's a veena recital that a Padam will be included. Therefore, the tempo is not extremely slow. It's fairly sometimes normal, sometimes even brisk. Uh, and apart from that, the Padam was no, no different from Ketana's because it was replete with details and subtle nuances. His repertoire of Padams was fairly large, Telugu as well as Tamil Padams, and he has taught many of them to my mother. And uh, Padma has played a few of them in her recitals. Yeah. 
his early students i don't think many of them progressed before beyond the ketana and the varnam but it was my mother who graduated to alapane and thanam and later when she taught me he took pains to record a spool tape with lots of ragas explained in detail he called it raga vilakkam again you can you'll observe that it's phrase driven the raga development is phrase driven not scale driven that is very important for this type this style of music famous jagannath bhakta sabha was founded in 1918 by trivengra acharya also known as muttanna the sabha was known for its characteristics of regularity and maintaining punctuality at a certain point muttanna requested rangaram aljanga to partner with him in running the sabha and it was rangaram aljanga who had uh, introduced Madras audience to eminent people like Palghat Maniya here, Payani Subramanya Pillai, Bellur Ramabhadran, uh, Alatur Brothers, and Bala Murli Krishna. And pointedly, I want to say the debut concert of Brinda Mukta and uh, her sister Abhirama Sundari was in this sabha. In 1974, the Indian Fine Arts Society awarded him the title. Sangeeta Kala Shikhamani. Surprisingly, there was no veena playing or music, but his other passion, konnakol, which he had picked up from konnakol pakri in Manargudi. His American students gave a lectem at the sabha to a very appreciative audience. his life work has been in continuous progress from 1938 onwards as we all know and even 
even now there are things which have not, he wanted to do but he didn't. For instance, he wanted to bring out a book on Shilapati Haram. He had drafts of lots of Varnams he had collected over the years and many compositions which he had not included in his Kritimani Malay. For instance, there is a recording of his playing the Devagandari Padam, Chetraya Padam, which is not there in the book. So he must have had many more compositions like this, which are not included, but which he would have liked to include had he lived longer. we can play him is to use his notation and to bring back the golden days of Carnatic music following the notation to revive the repertoire that he had protected with such care and love. So it is the uh, destiny of a few people that they end up serving the cause of the arts but unfortunately over a period of time that their service is gently forgotten and I think it's extremely important to talk about one such individual who has probably contributed the utmost especially to the preservation and promulgation of the Veena Dhanam style and of course to the instrument the Veena itself uh, and that is uh, Sri Ranga Ramanuja Iyengar uh, is known by various professions that uh, he uh, was uh, associated with, he was a teacher, a philanthropist, of course, a great music scholar and a musician. Uh, his service period, I would say, largely ranges from the late 30s uh, to the late 60s and 70s. It's a very large period of time in which, uh, and this was, we are talking about a time from pre-British, uh, pre-independence India to the time of the early building of arts institutions, who put in a lot of his own time, own effort, uh, completely self-motivated to the preservation and promulgation of Carnatic music. Specifically, um, his service towards Vainikas uh, across the country. Uh, he was associated with uh, not only training a very, very uh, uh, great uh, legacy of students, but also conducted training camps in as far afield as Varanasi, the north of India, northeast of India. Uh, spreading the idea of the Veena, of course, abroad as well. And um, in addition, his um, almost single-minded determination to preserve the work of Tyagaraja Swami in the form of Kritimani Malai, uh, the first hundred compositions, uh, apparently, uh, if I remember correctly, was released in the same year of, as our independence. It was in April 1947, uh, with a function held at the Museum Theatre in Chennai. And uh, 
at that time the release function itself uh, looking at his efforts uh, you know the usual suspects like uh, kasturi ayengar of the hindu and uh, others contributed to the effort one thing that hasn't changed is uh, people who want to make a difference and want to make a difference in fields that are not necessarily popular these are considered the arcane arts because i mean uh, this always appeals to a niche group end up actually changing the course of musical dialogue and history but are themselves forgotten uh, and that hasn't changed very much i think in this highly hyper commercialized and commoditized world that has only gotten worse so in that period to have gone after uh, I, the reason i mentioned 1947 is you can imagine what public attention funds and other things would have been at that time certainly not on music so much and certainly not on uh, say tyagaraj swami's uh, krithis uh, the idea of archiving them putting them into text form putting them into manuscript form so that future generations can start standardizing their practice is again a very very noble thought that can only come to a teacher and this is something that he managed to accomplish in 1947 um there are records of him conducting very very useful camps uh, in the north of india in the late 50s in the 60s um so i think this title of saying ekalavya uh, is extremely appropriate because he was self taught self motivated uh, and highly self driven and uh, did this service to the art of carnatic music um i think mention should be made of organizations like uh, jagannatha sangeet sabha um, of course uh, the early version of the music academy and uh, many such organizations which probably at that time were friends of his well wishers of his who did the maximum they could to support him somewhere in the pages of history this chapter has become slightly faded and uh, i congratulate uh, young shriram and the team of bark to resuscitate something that is of importance to not just musical historians but to young students of music and specifically students of the veena uh, this is an important part of that history and uh, resuscitating that makes all the difference many a gem of purest ray serene the dark unfathomed caves of ocean bear full many a flower is born to blush unseen and waste its sweetness in the desert air said thomas gray I take this opportunity to remember and honor the great Sri Rangaramana Jayengar, truly a self-taught ekalavya. It is said that he was such a huge, ardent fan and admirer of the legendary Veena Dhanamal that he would quietly sit in a corner during her famous Friday salon sessions and note down the intricacies and the nuances that she played. Veena Dhanamal happened to listen to him play and offered to take him on as her student. This lasted for a couple of years till her demise. The crowning glory, however, came during the centenary celebrations of the great bard Sri Tyagaraja. It was then that this compendium of a hundred select kritis of of Sri Tyagaraja, the Kriti Mani Malai, came out in all its glory. This was replete with swarams, nuances, gamakams, and so much more. A series of volumes followed. that this compendium has been used by musicians for decades and continues to be in use still today is testimony to the immense contribution made by shri ranga ramanu jayengar to carnatic music we are privileged beneficiaries of this treasure trove the sayan shri ranga ramanu jayengar representative of the great veena dhanamal bani one that i am privileged to have trained in is truly one such gem thank you r rangaramanu jayengar was a very interesting and uh, unique personality in the field of carnatic music it would appear that his interest in music was very uh, self encouraged so to speak and uh, in madras he became a great votary of the dhanam school of music in fact i would say that to him veena dhanamal was a kind of goddess who had descended on this earth in order to elevate all of us by performing on the veena to the extent that he even had a statue of her sculpted and placed in a prominent spot of worship in his house and uh, on friday evenings it was almost as though a puja was being done to it where he would perform on the veena 
in front of that uh, idol. That idol later on was acquired by T. Mukta, Veena Dhanamal's daughter, granddaughter, and uh, it still stands outside her flat in Gandhinagar. Rangaramanu Jayengar, uh, being a student of the Dhanam school, and uh, I say this uh, knowing fully well that people are not going to appreciate this, being a student of the Dhanam school, he therefore did not like music from most other forms, other schools of Carnatic music that existed at, in, his, uh, in his time. And when he wrote his memoirs, which is Musings of a Musician, he hardly had a positive word to say about anybody else. Uh, the book is not in circulation, but whatever few copies there are, I'm sure those who can lay their hands on them will find them to be a very interesting read particularly as regards musicians outside the Dhanam school. Whether the musicians outside the Dhanam school really like that book, I'm not in a position to say. Chances are that they do not. He ran a sabha called the Jagannatha Bhakta Sabha along with uh, Thirvenkitachari and, uh, or Muttanna as, as he was popularly known, the other man. And the two, this Jagannatha Bhakta Sabha operated from the veranda of Veda Vilas, the house of Divan Bahadur T. Rangacharya, a very prominent lawyer of Madras, even though it was the very antithesis of the music academy in the sense that it did not have a building, uh, people sat on the floor and fanned themselves with Palmyra fans when they heard the performances. It was in its time considered to be as demanding a sabha as the music academy was. And to be recognized at the Jagannatha Bhakti Sabha was really an indication of phenomenal talent. So that was the exacting standard to which that organization was run by Rangaramanu Jayengar. The Perhaps his greatest contribution in the field of Carnatic music was the monumental Krithimani Male. As he wrote himself, people were wanting to bring out an authentic compilation of Tyagaraja Krithis in time for the uh, in time for 1947, the death centenary of Tyagaraja, but he realized that very little was forthcoming from the committee that was formed for it. And so, at his own expense, he went ahead, compiled the book, got it published and released. Even today, it remi remains a monumental contribution. Thereafter, he did the same with Dikshitar and he did it with other composer composers as well. But there is no denying it that he was a Tyagaraja fan. Everybody else came second in line to Tyagaraja. That was his viewpoint. What is not remembered are two other minor contributions of his. Minor in terms of the Krithimani Male, but very major in their own respect. One of them, the first, was helping Madras Lalitangi to publish the Krithis of Purandara Dasa with notation in Tamil, the Purandara Manimala. During the Second World War, he helped her financially, he helped her by writing the notation and he also brought in the Hindu which supplied paper free of cost for the printing. The other was, he was one of the first people to recognize the talents of Papanasam Siban and he organized a public felicitation for Siban in the 1940s when a purse was collected and handed over to Papanasam Siban. So he was a very generous man. Under that tough exterior, he was also a very generous man. But he was not a man who was easy to get along with. Very often, these good Samaritans are like that. In the balance, I would say that Rangaraman Jayengar's contribution was hugely positive for the field of Carnatic music. And he deserves to be commemorated for all time to come. Thank you very, very much. Namaskaram to Rasikas. Having lived in Bombay and being a part of Brindamma's school of singing, I am very well acquainted with the Sri Rangaramana Jayangar style. I have absorbed a lot from his Kritimani Malai. Though I haven't met him, I do know Srimati Padma Varadhan well and have heard her play the Veena many a time. It is heartwarming to know that the documentary is launched during his 120th birth anniversary and will help us remember such a great person forever. My blessings to dear Sri Ram Shankar and good wishes to team Vak. Namaskaram. Aruna Sai Ram. <laughs>